Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. So the question on equality um, or equity, um, and whether one entails the other, that's the crux of the question, especially in relation to gender or sex or both. And we'll come to describing the distinctions between those categories, if there are. This lecture is going to be divided into three different uh, parts, inshallah. The first part is going to be an examination of the first principles of feminism and of traditionalist Islam. And the second part of this lecture will be what I deem are inconsistencies in the application of those first principles. And the third part of this lecture will be talking about what's referred to as intersectional feminism. And that's going to be an important part of this lecture. And it's important for the Muslim community to know what that means um, and how it can be effective both for us and how it's contradictory in many ways as well. So to draw kind of like a, a generic sketch of what second wave in particular, second wave feminist assumptions entail, and I've made this point before in many other lectures, the idea is that there are biological and anatomical differences between men and women. But despite those differences, a second wave feminist would argue, like Simone de Beauvoir famously argued, there should be equality of opportunity. This is the presupposition. Now, before I start talking about this in more depth, it's important to know that feminism and women's rights are not interchangeable terms. Feminism is a political ideology, which most of which has, has its writings based in the Western Hemisphere. Some say it's divided into three waves, and it has its own conceptions of women's rights. It does not have a monopoly of that. So you can have a non-feminist understanding of, of women's rights. And that's a possibility because to argue otherwise we'll be arguing actually in a circle. We'll be a circular argument. So when we say as Muslims that there are tensions and contradictions, and this, would, this is definitely something we're going to put forward today, between especially second wave feministic discourse and traditionalist Islamic discourse, this is an important note to make, that we are not saying that from a traditionalist Islamic perspective, from our perspective as Muslims, we're against women's rights. We cannot say this because the Quran is very clear about the fact that women's rights, the project, is something that Muslims must adhere to. Just like men's rights, just like the deity's rights, Allah's rights, animal rights, and so on. And so a Muslim cannot say we're against women's rights. This is actually counter textual. It goes against the sacred texts. The, the sacred text. For example, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, in Allah that certainly Allah does not <coughs> let to waste any deed of those who does good from you. Whether you're a man or a woman, and both of you are from each other. In other words, there is an equality in spiritual opportunity between men and women in Islam. And there even is a general equality in front of the law. Because the Prophet Muhammad he said, Inna And he said this in the context where a woman was doing the Prophet's wife was doing wudu. And she asked, is it the same for men and women? So he turned around and he said, certainly in the Manisal, Shikai for the Jada. It's the same for men and women, women, men and women are equal in this regard. Meaning in front of the law. Now this is a general equality. But of course the tensions will arise when you say, well hold on, there are exceptions. According to Islamic jurisprudence, for example, what women wear is different to what women, what men wear. There is a 
from an Islamic perspective, a justified binary between men and women. We should start by saying that. That we do believe in the category of man and the category of woman, and that there are certain regulations that apply to men that don't apply to women, and vice versa. And those are the exception to the rule of equality. Now, if you pick up like a maybe a, a popular book on feminism, like there's one that when we go to in, in, in the UK, a book, bookstore, they're there almost like right next to the where you're going to pay the money for the book. It's like forcing you to buy it. What's this book here? It's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a new popular, it's not really an academic book, it's called The Feminist Manifesto <laughs> by Ngozi, which is very famous now in terms of popular feminists. And in the front, like I think it's the first five pages or something, she, she candidly makes it clear that we believe in an absolute equality, where there's no exception whatsoever. There's no exception whatsoever. And I think she made the exception of breast milk, and she talked about what well, breast milk might be an exception, but this, that, and the other. Right? Now, this brings us to our first point. In examining, especially second wave feministic discourse, it's clear the premises, the premises, there are physical differences. Simone de Beauvoir makes that candidly clear. There are physical differences between men and women. We know them. We're not ignorant to them. She even mentions emotional differences in her book, The Second Sex, in her chapter on biology. She says there are even biological differences, anatomical differences, physiological differences, psychological differences, emotional differences. But the argument goes as follows. Despite those differences, there should be equality. Does that make sense so far? So if a second wave feminist would say, despite those differences, there should be equality afforded. What kind of equality? Political equality, social equality, economic equality. This is pretty much in a nutshell what the argument is. Now obviously, one could justifiably ask, what's the proof for that? What's the evidence for that? Why should that be the case? How is that entailment made? From first principles, philosophical first principles, how can you justify that? And that's really not a question that there is any answer to, frankly, or that there is any formula given for us on how to answer those questions. However, and this is moving on now to the second part of the lecture, which I want to spend a little bit of time on. Are we consistent? Or are feminists consistent? In particular, second with feminists, are they consistent in the application of those principles? Now, there are three things, three live examples I want to give you to show you how problematic these assumptions are for feminists. The first one relates, and I'm sure many of you might have been exposed to this. It's, it's a big thing on the news now, actually, that's why I'm bringing it up. It's the idea of transgendered sports. Now, I'm not sure if this is kind of um, spilled over to Malaysia, but this is certainly something, a hot topic in the West, in America and the UK, Western Europe. The question is, say for instance you have someone who identifies and who is identified biologically as a man. They do a gender reassignment surgery, and they become self-identified as a woman. Okay, so they do a gender reassignment surgery, and they become self-identified as a woman. Can they participate in sports with women? Now, second wave feminists, on the whole, seem adverse to the idea. Now, you can't make a generalization with anything. But big time second wave feminists like Jermaine Greer, who wrote the book in 1971, The Female Eunuch. She's like one of the founding mothers of feminism. And she, in an interview, she completely rejected the idea. And guess what she invoked? She invoked anatomical and biological advantage. Wait a minute. Hold on now. Hold on now. 
Let me hear the argument. Yeah, so the argument goes that since the person, and this is a very sensical argument to me, as a non-feminist, right? The argument goes, since men have anatomical, biological advantages, hormonal advantages, and even having gone through that process, and then the assignment, the gender reassignment happens, if they now compete with women, it will give them an unfair advantage and it will give them an entitled, overprivileged position in that context. Wait a minute. This is important now. I thought you said sex was a, or not sex, because that's a third way. Construct. Some say that sex is a social construct. Judith Butler hinted into this in her book, Gender Troubles 1990. But not this. Some do say that. I thought you said gender was a social construct. Oh. And do you know what? It becomes even more problematic. Do you know when it becomes more problematic? When we start to see... So the question is now, should there be an equality of opportunity for men and women in certain sports? Should we, or should we segregate and separate them? You don't like segregation, but you have it in sports. But no, it's justified for anatomical and biological reasons. So you're saying that on biological and anatomical grounds, you can justify separation? Well, hold on now, but men will be given an advantage. Why don't you make that argument in all contexts of categories? For instance, if you look at the 100 meter dash, and I made this argument before, I'll make it again. The 100 meter sprint, in the last 100 years, I don't know of one white man who's won that. <laughs> no, I don't know. I don't know of one white man who has won that. It's dominated by black people. Not only just black people, West Africans and Jamaicans. Should we separate the blacks from the whites? Wow. Now, if you say we shouldn't separate the blacks from the whites, you're contradicting yourself. You know why? Because you said in cases where there is biological and anatomical advantages for one category of person over another category of person, there should be separation. So why should that be the case only for gender? Why shouldn't it also be the case for race? Because you'll be called racist. This is selective invocation. You see, they are not even consistent with their principles. East Africans are very good at long distance. You know, we have someone called Mo Farah, very good runner, you know? They have an advantage. East Africans bodily, they have a bodily advantage. White people have an advantage in something, swimming. And I don't want to be controversial, but I've never seen a black man win that swimming race. I look for Michael Phelps. How many times do you want it? But we're we going to separate the blacks from the whites. We're not going to separate the blacks from the whites. So what kind of equality do you want? So some feminists would say we want equality of opportunity. And some would actually say we want equality of outcome. What? Oh, right, sorry. Yeah. Some would say we want an equality of opportunity. Almost all feminists would say that, in fact. So why don't you have an equality of opportunity in sports. Why don't we arrange parameters that mean that people of the same weight, whether they're men and women, they go together in competition. We can do that. It's not difficult. It's not difficult. In boxing, for example, you don't think there's 75 kilogram women? That's the most popular category for women. Let's bring them together. Fight. You want equality of opportunity. No, but that's advantage, man. But well, he said the anatomical thing. You see, it is really problematic. You have segregation. Acquiesced. Segregation. In some spheres. Where are the feminists? We need. We need to stand against this. Seriously.
If you're, if you're principally averse to a biological, anatomical argument, arrange parameters which does not discriminate on gender in the field of sports. Well, they'll never do that. Because it's not about equality, it's about entitlement. It's about where can we find the advantages. That's the problem. And this case becomes more exacerbated when we look at war. We need to rectify the social ills, problems of the past patriarchal society. And we need to have equality of opportunity in all spheres, in all industries, political, social, and economic. There should be absolutely no exception to that. But war, that entails death, that entails injury. We don't really know about that one. I've never actually come across a movement that aims to rectify a historic accumulation of gender discrimination against men in the field of war. Almost every military in every country in the world, in all of history, has been male-dominated. Men have died. Now, if we're being honest, we should say that's a severe matriarchy. You have forced men to be societally inclined or forced to kill themselves and fight themselves so for the protection of the country. So on feminism, if there's an equality of opportunity, we should address that historic discrimination and we should look at all the wars that men were dominating, the armies in them, and we should have female only conscription and draft forcing the women to fight for the men for at least the amount of time that would equalize the historic imbalance. No, but brother, there are biological and anatomical reasons why men should be on the front line and killing themselves for the protection of societies, including the women in them. But I thought despite the biological and the anatomical, there should be an equality. But it's only an equality where it's an entitlement. In, in, in parliament, in, in tall buildings, what about the dangerous jobs? which have been flooded by males, men. Is that patriarchy or is that actually a matriarchy? What should we call that? Men have felt the need to go to mining jobs, doing all kinds of dangerous work for the most part. So if we're going to go with the equality premise, shouldn't we rectify that? The problem is, guys, it's just too selective. You choose when to be absolutely equal, and you choose your own exception. This is the problem. So these are some clear examples of inconsistencies, even using the first principles of feminism, even using exactly what they're talking about. Now, moving on to the third part of this discussion. I want to talk about something which recently has come about, which is called intersectional feminism. And this has coined a term which is coined by someone called Kimberly Crenshaw. And the feminists have had a battering from different groups from within because of their colonialist and white supremacist inclination. So in the beginning, as you know, first wave feminism was concerned with universal suffrage. It was concerned with giving women the right to vote, which is a fair enough thing. I mean, I don't think anyone in this room will have any problem with that. You know, women have a right to vote, men have a right to vote, whatever. 
I don't even vote myself. I don't care about voting. But, you know, it's not something we care about, you know? Whatever, you know? The point is this. In the 60s, many blacks, it's called black feminism, it's kind of like a movement. One of the main people, but I think he's still alive, her name is Bell Hooks. She wrote many books talking about the fact that really the truth is the experience of second wave feminism has been a white experience. It doesn't include the black woman and it doesn't include the underprivileged and so on. And so there, there was a hammering from within. It was a term referred to as colonial feminism. The idea that this is actually the ideas of white women wanting to privilege themselves. They don't really care about in their books and their articles and in academic pieces, they weren't making the argument for the women of color. They were, it was lacking in the literature, lacking in the movement, lacking all, all together. In fact, think about it, the first wave feminism was a time where Britain was an empire, but there was never a, a call for decolonization of the colored woman, for example. I mean, this country was colonized by the British Empire at that time, wasn't it? Only in 1957 was it freed from the shackles of colonial administration. And so at that time, why weren't the white feminists in America and in Britain and in France saying, well, you know, our women in Malaysia and in Indonesia, in India and in Africa, they need to be freed. In fact, they were saying opposite things. They were saying that we, how can you give black people the vote before you give us the vote and so on. And they were making racial comments about the Aborigines, about black people, about all kinds of things. It was a racist movement to a large extent. And I explained this in one of my lectures. It's called Islam and the Dark Face of Feminism on YouTube if you want to watch it. Islam and the Dark Face <coughs> of Feminism. Some of the history of early feminism. But because of the fact that they were kind of battered from within, right? So they were forced at around like say 70s or 80s or something, right? To consider this idea of intersectional feminism. And so intersectional feminism considers not only gender, it says that the way a person identifies themselves is not primarily reduced to gender. They might, and this is true, they might identify themselves according to race, not, they don't really mention religion, frankly, but race, class, and sexuality, usually they focus on those three, yeah? Race, class, and sexuality, yeah? We, they, they will say, they will say that we have to consider all of these entangled and interlocking identifiers. We can't just think about race, uh, sorry, we can't just think about gender anymore, we have to think about gender in conjunction with race. We have to think about gender in conjunction with class, and so on. And so, on this thesis, a black woman, say for instance, living in, I don't know, you know, Zambia or something, yeah? Who is underprivileged, so in her own society, she is of the proletariat, she is working class. She's a completely different category than a white woman. They're two separate categories on this thesis. If they're two separate categories, they should be looked at differently according to this. And it's true. Why are we only looking at one parameter, gender? Why? So the issue with the term intersectional feminism is that it's a contradiction because you prioritize gender when you say feminism. What, who gave you the right to say feminism then? Why have you prioritized? Now, a fair thing to say, on their worldview, if they believe in self-possession, and they believe in self-determination, would be, the fair thing to say would be, let the woman decide for herself what she, or let the man decide for himself what they think, yes? What they think are the most important identifiers for them. In the order that they think, is most important for them. But this is a hierarchization which has been superimposed by colonial feminist discourse. In other words, 
white feminists in England and in the USA and in, in France, it's as if they're saying, let us prioritize your ideas for you. The most important thing you have to think about in your analysis is gender, then after that maybe it's race, then after that maybe it's class, and a Marxist would have something different to say about that, and you know, a radical would have something different to say about that, and so on. Yes? But why are you making that hierarchization? Who gave you the right to prioritize gender? No one gave you the right to. Conduct a survey. If you really want to be fair, on your own worldview, conduct a survey. Get, I don't know, a million Malay women, yes? And ask them, in order, what are the things you want to identify as the most? So, for example, if the Malay women say number one, religion, number two, uh, nationality, number three, gender, for example, right? Then you have no right to say to her that she should be a feminist because on her world's view, on her world's view, she has prioritized religion over and above gender and analysis. The thing about intersectional feminism is it has a propensity to philosophically self-implode, just like democracy. So in other words, if you really want to give someone the opportunity and chance to make a decision for themselves, when they make a decision which falls in line with a dominant discourse of some sorts, you have to leave them to that. You can't tell them now, no, you should always prioritize this and that. What if there is a tension and contradiction between white feminist understanding of gender, Eurocentric understanding of gender, and Islamic understanding of gender, which there are? What should this woman do? If she prioritizes Islam, on intersectional feminism, she has to follow it. So, the question we usually ask, guys, and that is usually asked of us, is how can Islam accommodate for feminism? That's the, the question. And they force people, you know, come on. Islam and feminism, let's go, let's, you know, come to the fem so, uh, so the society, whatever. I'm not saying they're doing anything, but they might, they might be doing great work here. I'm not sure what they're doing it. If they, if they, there is one, I'm not sure there is one. But yeah, there is one. Yeah, it's good. But the point is this. What are you just saying now? Are you paying attention? Right, so the point is this, right? If you give her the choice and she says, no, I, I actually prioritize religion over your conception of gender then that's it, it's the job done. The question therefore isn't, how should Islam accommodate for feminism? Listen to the question, it's how should feminism accommodate for Islam? Yes, it's not how should Islam, we're not going to accommodate, sorry. <laughs> that's how, that's my personal choice. I'm not gonna to bow to anyone. And this is hopefully what uh, many women will also agree with. I know they do. When there's a contradiction, we will prefer religious narratives over and above Eurocentric feministic ones. And you have to allow that. And if you disagree with that, you're against your own principles. You're a colonialist. You want to bring up, you want to, you want to force your fundamentalist. You're a fundamentalist. You have your own understanding of patriarchy, which we've already shown is flawed. But let's go with it. If feminism is true, and feminism is truly giving women the right to self-determination, then it should allow a woman to consent to being in a patriarchal structure. <laughs> Wait a minute. That sounds a bit like a boo right you throw it. Well, that's how it is, my friend. If, yes, if feminism purports to give women the rights to make their own decisions if they decide to live within patriarchal structures, that is actually in line with feminism because she's made her own decision. And if your job was to make or allow a woman to make her own decision, then your job is done. Leave us alone. Your job is done. 
If you want to free the space for a woman to make a decision, then when she makes a decision which goes against the Eurocentric narrative, don't be disappointed. Leave them alone. Don't be disappointed. That's how it is. Obey the husband. What? What do you have to say? <laughs> yes, obeying the husband can be part of feminism. What did you say now? Now, now, you're, now you're trying to manipulate the crowd. Now you're trying to manipulate the crowd. By the way, this whole idea of obe obedience to the husband is a caricature one. Yes, it's an, it is an orientalist caricature of the idea of obeying the husband. And they say, look, look at these women exoticizing them, tropicalizing them, and the Muslims. Look at this woman, they're in shackles, and the man, she is, this is not what happens in there. Uh, come on, is this, do you think this is what happens in Islamic households? The woman is, and the man, oh, yes, this is the caricature, really, really. That's what they think, this is happening. Uh, yeah, no, no. <laughs> it's that, serious, more into this image. Obedience is severely curtailed. I'll tell you of a few things. Islamic ethos, just for the non-Muslims, they don't know about the Islamic ethos. Islamic ethos, the Prophet says, "La ta'atun al-mubruqin fi masik al Number one, you cannot obey the creation in the disobedience to the Creator. This is a very important principle. It's not, it should not just be kind of swept under the carpet and uh, overlooked. So you think that Muslim men can just tell the woman, go and do this. No, it's against the Quran. I'm not going to do it, you do it. Yeah? If it's against the Quran, it's against the Quran. I'm here, you're only here to advise me on what you think the Quran says. If I agree with you, I will. Yes? Obey. If you say something, or drink alcohol. Let's go, take your hand. This happens, by the way. Take your hijab off. Some day youth husband says this to his wife. So, the problem here is, they think that obedience, this idea, which has been tropicalized, is fully encroaching. No, it's not. What about if it goes against her rights? What, there's no woman's rights in Islam. So if you go, go and work. In Islam, a woman doesn't have to work if she's in a marriage, by the way. She doesn't have to. Chicken, if she does make money, and that's the decision that the family has taken, she can take that money for herself. If not, she doesn't have to work. And that's a right of hers, by the way, that's not afforded on feminism. So if she decides, I don't want to work, the man says, no, it's going to be equal, I'm going to pay half the bill, you pay half the bill. She says, I'm not really interested in that. <laughs> he can't go and say, well, no, you have to be obedient to me. He says, no, I don't. You can't say this. And there are a plethora of examples. But there is an aspect. And there's something else I should mention as well. What if it goes against her bodily? Because the Prophet Muhammad says, says, La dara wa la dara. There's no harming or reciprocating harm. So he says, go and lift that big boulder. I don't know where the saying is in this analogy. Maybe they're on a farm or something, I don't know. And she says, I can't lift the boulder. He says, it's obedience to the husband. You have to lift the boulder. <laughs> yes. She says, you lift the boulder. He says, no, you lift the boulder. It'll be the start. She says, no, it's going to, I can't. She goes and tries to lift the boulder. She has a hernia or she has a problem, back problem. Come on. It's not, this is not in line with the conceptions of ta to the husband. What is the ta that we're talking about? Well, there's a consultation process, which is sunnah for us, by the way. And there are some tenants who act. And then he decides to overrule her judgment in certain issues where the A, B, and C category are not mentioned. It's against equality, my friend. There should be a perfect democracy. On feminism, there should be 50 50% decision making. This is the objection 50 50% decision making. So, what if, what will that create? Gridlock. 
Tell me one parliament in the, in the world that operates like that. You, the, every parliament tries to forge a majority, even, even the ones that are made with proportional representation. In Israel, they have the, the, the list system, I think, or PR, proportional representation, although there's no democracy there anyway, <laughs> for other reasons. And I like the relation, uh, you know, I saw something on, yes, on YouTube, and I think it was the Prime Minister or something, who was <coughs> saying some good things about this. I don't know what he said exactly. I don't want to see Yes. But you, you see the point, right? So how are we going to break the deadlock? Well, Islam actually allows, to be fair, there are some exceptions. For example, if it relates to breast milk, it's her body. The Quran, the Quran says, فَسَتُرْ دَعْلَهُ أُخْرَى For example, you can't force a woman to breastfeed. And by the way, it's interesting, I was reading some books of the Hanabi, like they said, which is the, the, the method that I yeah, they kind of follow, for the most part. They said that, you know, even if a woman, a married woman, because we know a divorced one, she should be paid for that breast milk. But a married one, yes, she should also be paid. Well, this is probably a weak opinion. <laughs> Let's not go with that one. I'm going to joke. But it's in the literature, right? It's in the, lit the idea is, the point I'm making is that it's not even in all cases, but there are cases. There are cases. Because a woman has certain advantages by virtue of motherhood as well. She has certain advantages there. Maternal advantages. And by the way, motherhood is a big can of worms for third wave feminists in particular, because they can't define it. So what's a mother? Someone who gives birth to someone else? Well then I thought you said anatomical differences. <laughs> yes, and biology. It's irrelevant. Third wave, they, they're very clear with that. So what about a surrogate mother? What about a woman that takes a baby from a surrogate mother? What about adoption? All of that is motherhood for them, right? So you don't even have a clear understanding of what motherhood is. You don't have defined parameters. You can't give mothers rights if you don't know who mothers are. But the idea is, in Islam, the mother is defined, the one who gives birth to the child. And so, when the woman gives birth to the child, there are certain rights that are afforded to her by virtue of being a mother, that are not afforded to the man. Like she has a three time more right in sohbah, or the companionship, or whatever, from the child. The child is definitely going to be, in most cases, more influenced by the mother than the father. How do you... This is an imbalance. On equality, this is an imbalance. How do you rectify that imbalance? So you give the man some rights, man. So give him some rights so he can boost, so he can be equilibrium a little bit. No. No. Okay, no problem. Even if they say no, this is our system. The question we started off this lecture with today, because it's 38 minutes of the lecture, and I try and keep things to maximum of 45, because I know that. We want to open this up, it's going to be a heated question and answer session because this brother here has got some, some questions. If you're looking at me, <laughs> yes, <laughs> especially when I was talking about transport. I don't know, is there something that you want to tell us about? The question is to what extent, if any, so no one says there's a precept hidden, no. It, to what extent, if any, should anatomical and biological differences, as well as psychological and physiological ones, account for moral or societal prescriptions? To what extent? And we have found in our looking at the first principles of second wave feminism in particular, the answer is to no extent whatsoever, they should have absolutely no say. But when in application that thesis is presented to them, the first people to talk about maternity leave, I'm not sure if the force of society is a society like a feminist society in England, is the one that does it, for example. Maternity leave is a discriminatory practice in England. One year from, I'm not sure if it's a year now or what they've changed the law or something like that. A man has two weeks of paternity leave, or well, there's a big disparity. But it's all based on biology. And many feminists agree with it. 
So lots of examples are counter to their absolute equality premise. And so really, it's as if they're saying, we know the difference, but we'll take the advantages when we'll find them. No, man. This is fallacious, contradictory, problematic. And that is why we say, that is why we say that Islam proposes the following idea, that there is an all-knowing, all-wise, all-powerful entity who we call Allah, who revealed in a message to his final prophet Muhammad وسلم, a message which has all of the required rules and regulations regarding to where there should be an exception. We both agree that there should be exceptions in a way, yes? But the question is where should the exceptions be? And by the way, we even agree on, uh, agree on dress codes. Things like dress codes. If, if for the most part, if a man takes his shirt and a woman takes off her shirt in a public road, it's completely different in most Western countries. I, I remember one time, just to go on a quick tangent, I've got a little bit of time. I was, I was in Leicester Square, a place in uh, central London, where we were given dawah to the non-Muslims, speaking to them and so on, speaking to them about Islam, invitation to Islam, and trying to educate people about Islam and so on. And the um, woman was there, I think she was a bit tipsy, or maybe a bit drunk. So she was talking to me. I thought maybe I shouldn't talk to her. But she came anyways, and I thought, okay, I'll give her a few answers. If I find that she can't contain this, this conversation, I'll try and make a swift retreat. So she said, why is it that women have to wear the hijab? Basically, that was her question. I said, look. I said, but most of us agree that anatomical differences have a say in what we wear. Most of us agree to that, so socially and culturally even, right? And I gave her the example, I said, for instance, in most cultures, even Western ones, if a man takes off a shirt in the summertime and a woman takes off a shirt, when a man does it, it's seen as absolutely normal, to be honest with you, yes? It's not seen as, especially in London, hot day, take your shirt off, in the park, no problem. Especially in beaches, which is a different paradigm altogether, by the way. But if a woman does it, it's seen as public disorder. See, we don't agree with that. A lot of feminists will say, no, we don't agree with that, though. And some of them will say, okay, well, we understand. But the idea is that you've particularized and specified Islam as the discourse of analysis. If you have a problem with men and women, Dressing differently, you shouldn't single out Islam then, because in your own culture you have that. That's the issue, that's the, that's the argument. So the point is this, to final, finalize the discussion, we, we spoke about the fact that anatomical differences, despite us trying to run away from it as much as we can, have shaped everything almost from A to Z. Even for feminists, they consider it very closely, they look at where the advantages are, and they strategically play on those advantages. Probably the most consistent feminists in this regard are third wave feminists, queer feminists, and so on, who actually do make the argument, for example, in the trans example, that a trans person should, in fact, participate in the sports. Um, if they have done the gender reassignment surgery. Finally, we talked about the discourse. Muslim societies now seem to have pressures on them. Muslims within those societies seem to be facing those pressures to feminize. And this should be seen as a Eurocentric type of colonial expansionism of ideological proportions. And we should realize that this is dawah. They are doing dawah to you. Simple as that. They are trying to invite you to their way. And this micro-feminist narrative of is compatible with Islam, and let's come in through you know, these means and so on, is a false one for so many reasons we've discussed them. For a Muslim man or for a Muslim woman, in order to remove all cognitive dissonance, 
And cognitive dissonance is the idea that you say one thing, but you believe another. And it gives you a psychological kind of problem. To remove that from your life and to have peace of mind, seriously, you really do have to decide to make a decision whether you want to submit to the law or not. To submit to the law of Allah, to the scriptures, to the divine texts, or not. And you can make a feminist case for that through intersectional feminism, as we've discussed. And they can't say anything about that. But you have to have that decision made in your mind. And with that, I will leave the floor. It's four or five minutes exactly. I'll leave the floor, inshallah, for the questions and answers. Thank you very much for your time.